So how should we think about security in this environment? How should we define security in, with, with this, in, against this kind of a landscape? Well, what's really interesting about it is that security is typically something that societies a hand, a, assign to their governments to handle. We want safe streets. Governments, you run the police. We want to have a safe country. Governments, you make the law, you run the military. Security is something that governments are used to being not only the biggest player on, but the monopolist. In almost every sense of the word, they're the ones that actually fill that space, they monopolize that space through their own physical presence with the consolidated control, legitimate uh, consolidated control over lethality that I spoke about, but also by making the rules and being the vehicle through which the, re the regulation of this space is made. And so governments are used to being the monopolist in the security space, and they are in all space except cyberspace. Governments have not been given this assignment. Why? In my view, because they don't have the power that matters. It's the power to connect, not the power to protect that matters, and that power is coming out of the private sector. So we're gonna see everything changing. We're seeing the role of government in our lives changing. We're seeing the role of the private sector in our lives changing. We're seeing expectations of responsibility, something approaching you know, to be more commensurate with the power and influence that private sector companies yield. Does this mean we're gonna turn companies into governments? No. But does this mean that there is one of the social effects of all of this is that, that people are gonna now expect more. We expect more from Apple. We expect more from Google. We expect more from Facebook when it comes to handling, for example, our personally identifiable information. So one of the jobs that I had when I was in Homeland Security was I was the lead US negotiator for the United States with the European Union on a big data sharing agreement um, called PNR, Passenger Name Record. Terabytes of data exchanged every single day about people potentially flying to the United States um, and quite detailed information. Um, and what we knew is that we use this information. I mean, data exchange is never its own point. You use it for operational purposes. And our purposes were the safety and security of the traveling public. Um, and so what we had to do in this regard was sort of reconcile, not sort of, was actually, I mean, the, the negotiation to a very large extent pivoted around privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties, and the protection of information. And what we discovered in that negotiation is that we and the Europeans have very different views of privacy. You know, on, the, on the European side, the way I come to, I've come to understand the European view of privacy is that the individual control, the individual author, the originator of the information, controls, has the right of control of that information for the lifetime of the information. So if you're going to put it out there, you control it. <laughs> And, and you're seeing a lot of regulation and discussion in the European context that reflects that very fundamental view. The view of privacy in the United States is the individual has the ability to limit the intrusiveness of government into your life, into your private space. These are two very different views of privacy. And what we found we had to do because we were operationalizing the exchange of information, again, exchanging information is never its own point, you do something with it. <clears throat> we constructed a physical, and process regime that frankly is state of the art in terms of how to collect, share, protect, use, store, and keep information. So much, and, it, and it, when I say state of the art, it really is. I mean, since the Snowden revelations, there have been three, three, I think, I think the third one is like sort of right now or just was, um, inspections of Homeland Security's receipt and, and holding of this information. Are we doing what we said we were gonna do? And it is state of the art, and the Europeans point to this all the time um, as one of the, the very best models of practice. So if you're coming back to this whole question, right, of, of what at some level are the real strategic issues affecting our lives. You know, during the Cold War, the concepts that dominated foreign policy and defense decision making were abstract concepts, deterrence, Okay, three corps in Europe, 60% of the United States Army during the Cold War was deployed in Europe. Deterrence, civilians invented these concepts. They sat around and, and were all part of the, de the debate. Containment, US military forward deployed, two corps in Europe, okay, three, okay, one and a half, okay. These are abstract concepts. Since the Cold War and since the, the acceleration of the internet and cyberspace, the concepts that are dominating not only foreign policy and defense decision making, but our lives, are operational concepts. You know, in the 90s, the whole question was, you know, we need to deploy a brigade in 96 hours. What's a brigade? And if you haven't been an operator, if you haven't served, you don't know. 
And similarly today, the concepts that are dominating decision making are, are dominated by the language, vocabulary, um, and ideas behind the globalization of access to the internet. So again, the three questions meet at the core of the interesting problems that we have to solve in a very pragmatic way, in a very practical way, from a technology point of view is, how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? That is the problem right now. I think I know part of the answer to that. Part of the answer to me is, is, is cyber hygiene. We can talk about that if you have an interest. I mean, there are four or five things that, there are four or five things that you can do that will eliminate 80 or more percent of all known attacks, that will prevent 80% of all known attacks. The big policy question is, what will the role of governments be in this space, in our lives, on these issues going forward? And the real question, I think, the big money, money ball question out there is, how will we maintain the openness of the internet when the biggest threat to that openness is the fundamental lack of security? Thanks very much. Thank you.